Noah Burgess had it made. During the summers of my teenage years, I spent nearly every night sitting with my dad at the lumber yard, which coincidentally was both the name of the local ballpark in the town where I grew up and the name of a popular strip club in the town where I went to college. <laughs> Two very different kinds of lumber. <laughs> Our lumber yard was home to the lacrosse loggers, a collegiate summer baseball team from the Northwoods League. It's the kind of team your town gets when you're not quite important enough for minor league baseball, which is what your town gets when you're not quite important enough for major league baseball. <laughs> and at every game, standing there at the top of the ramp leading up to the grandstand was Noah Burgess, perched in the glistening twilight, a man among mortals, the paragon of human achievement. For Noah Burgess was paid to watch baseball. At the end of each inning, he'd stroll leisurely across the grandstand holding up a yard sign bearing the name of one of the loggers' sponsors. And then, when play resumed, he'd return to his spot and stand there to enjoy the game. Just stand there. It was on those summer evenings, staring out from behind my logger dog and cheese curds, <laughs> stranded somewhere between jealousy and admiration that my future suddenly became clear. That could be me, I'd whisper, <laughs> as Noah leaned back against the railing, yard sign dangling limply at his side, its message just visible behind his fingers. Midwest fuel, we deliver. <laughs> I could live out my days on the ball field, watching the sun set over the Miller Lite mezzanine, <laughs> dancing to the symphony of footsteps that race to take advantage of the two-for-one root beer float special after every double play. <laughs> oh, sweet paradise. I loved baseball. My adolescence was defined by the summer road trips I took with my dad from our home in La Crosse, Wisconsin to Atlanta or Pittsburgh or St. Louis and back. 10 ball games in eight days. A stop in Fort Wayne, Indiana to see the minor league tin caps in the afternoon and Cincinnati by seven to see the Reds. And every magical hour in between was spent talking about baseball, 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 as endless stretches of beautiful nothing radiated out from the freeway. This is the way I learned to see America, through its baseball teams. This is the way I learned to see my father. And it is this game, this ancient game played on a field of dust that has kept me forever tethered to my uncle Paul. Now, I don't remember my parents ever explaining to my sisters and me that Paul had Down syndrome or what that was or what it meant. I just remember Paul. Whenever he came with us to a baseball game, he'd order the same thing. Hot dog, bottle of regular Coke, and a straw. Even with the bottle, there was always the straw. At some point in his life, one of his siblings had told him that drinking soda through a straw was better for his teeth. So that was that. Now, the ironic thing is that his teeth were already pretty much rotten, and there was nothing that <laughs> drinking soda through a straw was ever going to do to help them, but Paul didn't see it that way, so there was always the straw. Paul was my favorite uncle. He had memorized the birthdays of all 17 of his nieces and nephews, was always the first to call. He would sit on the porch swing with his headphones on, singing at the top of his lungs for hours in a key that was all his own. <laughs> I will never forget the moment the lights came on at his 30th birthday party and an entire church basement packed with people from all around the community shouted, surprise! And Paul triple pumped his fists and let out a euphoric roar like he had just won the World Series. My dad used to tease Paul like any good big brother would. Uh, and like my dad and I, Paul lived and breathed the Chicago Cubs. And after every visit with him, my dad would declare, you're in charge of the Cubs till next time we see you. So the next time we saw him, when the Cubs had inevitably gone on another prolonged losing streak, he would waste no time reminding Paul who was supposed to be in charge. <laughs> Summer before my senior year of high school, I got my golden ticket. 
and Paul was beaming when he heard the news. I had been hired by the lacrosse loggers. <laughs> but to my horror, when we were assigned our positions for the summer, I was not handed a sign and placed beside Noah at that idyllic perch on the grandstand. Oh no, I was banished to the very, very bottom. My post was the main concession stand, a detached structure located behind the grandstand whose only temperature was so hot, you could boil a hot dog by placing it in your sweaty palm and counting to 10. <laughs> now, it would be one thing to be exiled to the concession stand and work the register where I would at least be afforded a modicum of human interaction, but no. My job was to stand in the darkest, hottest corner of the room, place hot dogs in buns, wrap them in parchment paper, and pass them off to Gina, a cool mom who had been deemed worthy of being seen and heard by the general public. <laughs> we stood at attention as the stadium gates opened for the first game and the fans flooded in. Gina was at the helm. To my left, Liza, the fry cook, was droning on about her son's latest trip to the county jail. And on the far end of the stand, the soda machine was guarded by a man named Goose, who could easily have been anywhere from 13 to 47 years old. <laughs> the first order was simple enough. Two dots brought with kraut. But I didn't hear it. I was staring down at the warmer, hypnotized by the lifeless, ash-gray wieners floating there like, <laughs> like a pool of dead fish. Two dots brought with kraut. Let's get it moving. The second call snapped me into motion. I fumbled for a hot dog bun and tore it as I pulled it out of the bag. Okay, I tossed the bread into the trash and tried again, but more orders were already rolling in from the other lines. Two brats, one with, one without. Cheese curds and a Sprite. Four lager dogs, four Cokes, no ice. Soda-filled souvenir cups were dancing out of Goose's hands at an impossible pace, and I had yet to wrap a single hot dog in parchment paper. <laughs> Gina was growing impatient. The lines of customers grew. Even Liza had paused her story to marvel at my incompetence. I tried to make a joke to ease the tension, a coping mechanism that had gotten me all the way through high school, but was interrupted pre-punchline by a threatening cry of faster on the dogs. I wasn't made for this. I was supposed to be out there parading across the grandstand with Noah Burgess holding a sign for the Dairyland Power Cooperative, not fishing for repurposed rods of meat in a sweaty dungeon. <laughs> I closed my eyes, and for a moment, I was sitting down the third baseline with my dad or speeding down I-90 on the way to Fort Wayne or lying on the floor of the cottage letting Paul convince me the last place Cubs were going to the World Series, that there was still hope. <sighs> but with Paul, there was always hope. A few days later, my dad got the call. Blood clot. Paul had been taken by a helicopter to a hospital in Rochester, and it wasn't looking good. Two hours later, all of us were there. My parents and sisters and I, grandma and grandpa, aunts and uncles and cousins, my yellow logger staff t-shirt sat in a crumpled ball on the floor of my room, still unwashed from the night before. Someone else would have to make the hot dogs tonight. At the hospital, Paul was talking to us like he always did, going on and on and on about whatever was on his mind that day, smiling wide every time one of us walked in. It was, wh what could he have possibly done to get so lucky? It was everything he could ever want his 30th birthday all over again. Before we left, Paul asked me if we could all watch the Cubs game together later that night. Of course, I said. We didn't get the chance. When I search for the memories of what happened next, all I can find are the shape of a waiting room, a a wooden bench, Paul's right hand, these fragments where I so desperately wish the memories would be. I 
do remember the funeral. My mom coordinated the music and asked me to sing something, and I remember standing there in front of the piano, staring out across the congregation at everyone Paul had ever loved. Heads bowed, hands folded, praying for heaven. But he'd already been there. He'd sat between me and my dad on a cheap metal bench, watching grown men play a meaningless game that meant everything. So I sang about baseball. The summer sun high in a baseball sky shines like diamonds. And it's what you'd call a dream. A few days after the funeral, I went to work, and it was just as miserable as before. <laughs> Somewhere outside, a baseball game was being played, but all I could see or hear or smell were these shriveled gray hot dogs bubbling away in their little swamp. And all I could think was, who's in charge of the Cubs? And then through the concession stand window, over the tattoo on the back of cool mom Gina's shoulder, <laughs> I saw my dad. He'd come to the game by himself, just like he had almost every night that entire summer. And I listened as he placed his order, but it wasn't his usual. Hot dog, bottle of regular Coke, and a straw. Slowly, I placed the hot dog in the bun, the bun on the parchment paper, and rolled. I looked up and glanced across the stand. I may not have gotten my perch in the glistening twilight, but I was still there. Gina was counting change and making small talk with my dad, and Goose was reaching into the cooler for a bottle of regular Coke. And Liza was rambling on about her son, who was back in jail, but this time it was not his fault. <laughs> and the crowd roared, but I had no idea why. Noah Burgess did, lucky bastard. <laughs> and the hot dogs all looked like ash. And Paul was gone. But the sun shined like diamonds, and it's what you'd call a dream. Give it up for Vamp first-timer Matt Halpert!